Góðan dag, ég ætla að setja þennan fund sem haldin er með bandarískum sérfræðingi á svolítið óvennilegu sviði með að við það sem hefur verið fjallað um að að undaförnu það er að segja að hann er ekki bara að fjalla um reglur heldur fjalla um hvernig fjallað er um reglur og það er auðvitað mjög mikilvægt að hugsa um þessa leið vegna þess að eitt að því kannski sem hefur brugðist bæði hér á landi og annars það er gaggrínin umfjöllun blaðamanna það sem menn hafa bæði gaggrínni og þekkingu vegna þess að oft vantar ekki gaggrínni en hún er oft grunn vegna þess að þekkinguna vantar og hér á landi vantar okkur kannski þetta sárlega og ég held að blaðamenn séu hér mjög oft meðvita erum þetta og ég ætla að skipta yfir í ensku It is my pleasure to uh, welcome today uh, Mark Sheff, Jr., who's a reporter at the Washington Bureau of Investment News. Uh, it's a uh, ma magazine published by the Crane Communications, and he writes about legislation and regulations that affect uh, investment advisors and brokers, and especially of the implementation of the Dodd-Frank financial reform law. He covers uh, Washington, uh, as uh, you would uh, presume. He covers Congress, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Industry Regulatory Authority, and the Department of Labor, and uh, all the regulators. Uh, Mark uh, has uh, wide experience in uh, journalism, and I won't uh, read all his Resume. He uh, is a graduation, graduate of, of Purdue in Indiana, uh, which, uh, uh, well, many of you know uh, Purdue, many of us know Purdue, especially for its basketball team. So it's uh, exciting to hear and see another side of, uh, of Purdue uh, products. So uh, without going further, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, uh, for that uh, introduction. This is my first uh, visit to Iceland, and uh, it's a, a pleasure for me to be here to address the uh, Iceland Shareholders Association. And um, I, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, uh, Tak Ferrer, I, I hope I said that right. I meant to say thank you in in, uh, in Icelandic, and also I appreciate uh, Wilhelm Wilhelmar uh, Bjarnson's uh, hospitality. He's been uh, showing me around for the last day, and uh, I'm I'm enthralled by uh, by your your country, and I, I also see how how Wilhelmar who is uh, a natural uh, politician. Uh, he was just elected to the uh, the parliament here and in, anywhere we go uh, he either knows someone who's there in a museum or some other place or uh, or he's making new friends so uh, his uh, political abilities are, are apparent. I, as uh, was mentioned, I work in uh, Washington DC uh, covering uh, uh, regulations and um, one thing Everyone is waiting on the implementation of the Dodd-Frank financial reform law. Uh, those of us in the U.S. and those of you in, in the rest of the world. It was enacted in July 2010, and as of November 1, only 39.3% of its regulations have been uh, finalized. That's according to a study by Davis Polk and, and Wardwell. And the simple reason for this is the, the politics of regulation. Uh, you, you may have, have noticed in the U.S. that the, the Congress was uh, uh, the Congress and, and uh, the, the Obama administration were uh, uh, 
wrapped up in a fight over the budget and the debt limit uh, recently. And uh, the same dynamic is at work, although a little less dramatically, on, on financial regulations. And essentially, what's happening is uh, resistance from Wall Street and uh, uh, financial companies is, is slowing the, the path toward finalization of regulations that uh, in many cases were designed to protect in, uh, consumers and add transparency to the market. When looking at the, the politics of regulation in the U.S., it's, it's important to understand uh, how the Securities and Exchange Commission is set up. It's the primary regulator of uh, U.S. financial markets. There are five commissioners. Uh, the chairman is Mary Jo White, and then there are two uh, Democratic commissioners, Luis Aguilar and Kara Stein, and two Republican commissioners, Daniel Gallagher Jr. and Michael Pivovar. The commission has a 3-2 split in favor of the, um, uh, of the party that's in power in the White House. So thanks to President Obama winning re-election uh, in uh, November, last November a year ago, the uh, White House, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission is still three to two in favor of Democrats. Now, technically, Mary Jo White says she's a political independent, but if you're appointed as chair of the SEC by a Democratic president, everyone assumes you're, you lean Democratic or else you wouldn't have gotten that job. So in this three to two split, uh, or if there is a three to two split on, on regulations, Mary Jo White is likely to be the, uh, the swing vote. And this, this setup is important for uh, Republicans and the, um, the financial industry because a commission like the SEC gives them an opportunity to, to have more, gives them more leverage in, in uh, influencing regulations. Because if you can get the two Republican commissioners to go to, to side with you, then um, you're, you're more likely to uh, get your, um, what you want uh, uh, accomplished. The, um, just so you know, the, these, these people who I'm going to introduce you to are probably not, I'll say they're definitely not household names in Reykjavik, but uh, on... Uh, in terms of uh, members of Congress who have oversight of the, uh, of the SEC, you have agency critics like uh, Jeb Henserling of Texas, who's a strong conservative. He's chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, Scott Garrett, a Republican of New Jersey, is chairman of the House Financial Services uh, Subcommittee on Capital Markets. Uh, and uh, he's a member of this right-wing um, gr uh, um group of House members called the Republican Study Committee. On the Senate side, Mike Crapo of Idaho is ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, like most uh, senators, he tends to have less of an edge uh, than, than his House colleagues, but he also is, is uh, a consistent SEC critic. On the other side, in terms of allies, the allies tend to be Democrats, allies of the, of the commission. Uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California is the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee and an outspoken liberal. And uh, she, for instance, has sponsored a bill that would allow the SEC to charge user fees for investment advisor oversight. And I'll get into more of that in a moment. Senator Tim Johnson of uh, South Dakota is chair of the Senate Banking Committee. And Jack Reed of Rhode Island, former chairman of the Senate Banking Subcommittee on Securities, Insurance, and Investment. He's a leading SEC advocate. He wants to give the agency more latitude in assessing penalties on financial, comp uh, financial companies. The, uh, a as you may know, the Republicans hold the majority in the U.S. House. The Democrats hold the majority in the U.S. Senate. Now, some of the tension points between the SEC and Congress, one is perennial, and that's the the uh, budget, um, the SEC operates on a $1.32 billion budget at the moment. As, S as the SEC, as SEC officials often point out, that's less than a major Wall Street firm spends in a year to uh, market itself. So uh, places like J.P. Morgan or uh, Morgan Stanley or Merrill, Bank of America Merrill Lynch 
spend more money just to advertise their products than the SEC has total. Uh, they want to increase it to $1.6 billion in part to hire 250 more investment advisor examiners. Uh, but there's a lot of resistance from Republicans who say the SEC has to uh, do more, has to reform itself uh, before it uh, gets more money. And the, uh, the budget sequester has cut $66 million out of the SEC budget. In terms of some of the, uh, the issues uh, that um, the SEC is dealing with, one is fiduciary duty. This, this is one that I cover quite extensively. Uh, the agency is considering whether to raise standards for brokers who provide retail investment advice, requiring them to act in the best interest of their customers. This is something that investment advisors already have to do. This is a, an optional regulation within the um, Dodd-Frank financial reform law, which means the SEC could do it or not do it. One of the reasons the SEC hasn't moved forward with it is resistance from Wall Street, the financial community in general, Republicans in particular on the House or in the um, in Congress, and I'll explain more of that in a moment. Uh, other areas of uh, other controversial areas, private funds as of September 23rd can now advertise to the general public in the U.S. So if you are selling unregistered securities, you can uh, put out TV advertise TV and radio advertisements. You can um, post uh, uh, information on, on the internet about your offerings. You can still only sell them to accredited investors, that is investors who have a certain amount of, um, of uh, income or net worth, but you can advertise them anywhere you'd like. Uh, the SEC is now considering amendments to that rule that would add investor protections and uh, uh, GOP Republican members of the House and Senate are resisting that. Other thing, private fund oversight, uh, the SEC it, through Dodd-Frank um, was given authority, uh, or I should say uh, private funds, private equity funds and hedge funds had to register with the SEC uh, through Dodd-Frank and uh, that was meant to give the agency a better window into their operations and deter to determine whether they were doing anything that caused a, that would cause a systemic risk to the US financial system but Republicans in, in in the house are saying wait a minute wait a minute you're, you're spending too much time on private funds you're going too far and uh, and you you should uh, you should not spend so much time and resources on hedge funds and and private equity funds Money market reform is another way that the SEC is trying to address systemic risk in the U.S. financial system. It has proposed rules that are designed to prevent runs on money funds, that is to prevent investors from uh, exiting in a stampede uh, when the funds uh, break the, the $1, the typical $1 uh, uh, redemption uh, level, that is when they break the buck. But industry and GOP critics say that the proposal would undermine key characteristics of the funds, such as stable, their stable value and, and liquidity, and that, uh, that rulemaking is, is underway now. And finally, just last week, the, uh, there was a bill uh, that the House approved, 254 to 166, that would stop the Department of Labor from issuing its own fiduciary duty rule, that is a rule that would raise investment advice standards for brokers who advise retirement plans, brokers who sell individual retirement accounts and those who advise 401k plans. It would, it would, it would make them um, uh, fiduciaries. They'd have to act in the best interest of their clients. This bill passed the Republican House 254 to 166. It, uh, uh, critics say that the the legislation would effect effectively kill the DOL rule because the legislation says that the Department of Labor cannot move forward until, with its fiduciary duty rule, until the SEC uh, does its um, uh, does its own uh, um, promulgates its own fiduciary duty rule. The problem is the SEC, as I said earlier, is working on a fiduciary duty rule that is optional under Dodd Frank. It may decide not to do one at all in which case DOL couldn't move forward with its rule. 
So supporters argue that the agencies, the two agencies must coordinate their efforts to raise investment advice standards or else uh, um, there will be overlapping regulations that are confusing for consumers and costly for market participants and, and would ultimately limit the amount of, uh, would drive brokers out of the market and, and deprive middle income investors of, of advice options. So uh, uh, the, um, there are different ways that uh, different congressional and, and industry leverage points with the SEC. Uh, one thing that uh, Republicans in the House like to do is bring the SEC chairman up to Capitol Hill for hearings. Chairman White's successor, Mary Shapiro, appeared uh, more than 40 times in five years. Often it was before the House, and often it involved um, uh, pretty harsh critiques from uh, Republicans about how the agency was doing, although no one ever uh, called for her resignation. There was still a lot of pressure put on uh, Mary Shapiro. The, one of the flashpoints in, in U.S. regulation right now is something called cost-benefit analysis. The Republican lawmakers and, and Republican uh, SEC commissioners emphasize the need uh, for, for regulators to uh, justify through economic analysis that a proposed regulation will do more good than harm to the market. Uh, they are insistent that the, that the SEC produce these analyses that, that demonstrate that there is a need for regulation and, and, and that the regulation will actually uh, help rather than uh, hinder uh, the, the, the market as, as we know it. Also, uh, federal courts have um, vacated SEC rules based on what they say are in, insufficient economic analyses. So this is, a, again, a flashpoint. Critics say that the true goal of cost-benefit analysis is to delay or stop regulations. Really, what cost-benefit analysis advocates want to do is, is slow things down. And then there's also, there's also the comment letters. When the SEC proposes a rule, they then take comments and they could receive uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of comment letters on regulations. The staff wades through them and often revises proposed rules before uh, promulgating uh, final rules. And uh, that's an opportunity for the industry to, to make its uh, arguments about why a, a, a certain rule needs to be walked back a little bit or perhaps watered down, and, um, uh, and that's a, a, a staple of, uh, of the process. Now, what's, uh, what's happening really is that the industry is, is asking for certainty. They say that the problem is there's, uh, we're, we're operating in, a, in, uh, in an atmosphere of uncertainty because only 40% of the Dodd-Frank rules have been approved, and we, we really don't know what's, what's coming next or how this law will work. The other side of that is the industry is creating uncertainty itself through uh, um, uh, insisting on cost-benefit analyses, which slow the process down, and, uh, and really trying to, to have it both ways. They, they don't want more regulation, uh, and, and the way that they uh, and then they try to slow it down, but um, that, that's creating even more uh, delay and uncertainty. Some of the recent, um, here are some of the recent uh, uh, stories I've, I've covered. Just last week, the, the House approves the, the delay in the DOL fiduciary duty rule, but that measure faces uncertainty in the Senate, which is controlled by Democrats, and the Obama administration has already uh, um, uh, promised to, uh, to veto it. I, I did a, uh, a profile of the two new SEC members, Kara Stein and Michael Pivovar. Uh, Kara is, is a Democrat and Michael is a, a Republican. They were both former uh, um, aides to the Senate Banking Committee for their respective parties. Uh, Mike was the uh, chief economist for the Republican staff and Kara was chief of staff for Senator Reid when he was chairman of the Securities Investment and Insurance Subcommittee. Their nomination and a confirmation as um, uh, commissioners tells you a little bit about the, the politics of regulation because 
the, the Obama administration selected two um, staffers who senators knew well because it would ensure that they were quickly confirmed. The Obama administration has run into all kinds of problems getting their nominees for various federal agencies confirmed and this was one way that they thought that they could sail through and in fact they did. The next story SIFMA squares off with SEC Advisory Group over fiduciary standard. SIFMA is the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association and um, it's, it's probably the most powerful Wall Street trade association and uh, they, they say they're in favor of a fiduciary standard for uh, retail investment advice, but, uh, uh, and, and, and most fiduciary advocates take them at their word on that, but the real debate is going to come down to the, the implementation of it. If the SEC ever moves forward with the fiduciary duty rule, it's, it's how is it implemented, what are the details of it. And there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's growing tension between SIFMA and the SEC Investment Advisory Committee, which is supposed to represent smaller investors. The SEC Investment Ad Investor Advisory Committee wants a strong fiduciary duty regulation. SIFMA, the Wall Street Trade Association, wants one that, that accommodates the broker-dealer business model. And uh, again, this is tension over, over a, a, a rule that, that ostensibly would protect consumers that would um, make up really for the lack of financial literacy in, in the U.S. financial market markets. Most investors, a recent um, poll uh, showed that uh, most investors don't understand basic things like the relationship between a bond price and um, interest rates and, and how they move inversely. Uh, so we have in the U.S. a lot of investors who are not, um, uh, are not experts at all <laughs> in, in, in finances. And uh, if, when they go to a financial advisor, that advisor must act in their best interest, uh, presumably that, that would help them. But this, this rule is, is hung up at the SEC. Right now, brokers operate, investment advisors have to meet a fiduciary standard that is operate in the best in interest of, the, of their clients. Uh, brokers adhere to a less stringent suitability standard which means that the products that they sell to their clients must be suitable to the client, uh, that they must meet the client's risk appetite and investment needs and, and investment outlook, but they could sell a client a, a product from their own inventory, their company's inventory, like a mutual fund that has a higher fee attached to it than a mutual fund sold by another company. So they, they can sell something that has a higher fee uh, as long as it fits you know, the, the investor's purposes, whereas uh, if you're an investment advisor, you must do what's in the best interest of the client, which presumably has put them in the lower fee fund. Uh, the um, lobbyists put hands in sausage maker. The F Financial Services Institute, FSI, uh, my, they represent independent broker-dealers. And they, they have mounted a, an aggressive opposition campaign to the DOL fiduciary duty rule. And it was, it was found, not by me, but by another magazine, although I, I wrote a blog post about it, that FSI had uh, drafted a letter that um, uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus sent to the Department of Labor, telling the Department of Labor to, to, to halt the, its own fiduciary duty rule. Well, it turns out that FSI drafted that letter. This is not quite the scandal you would think it is. Uh, interest groups on both sides of the debate um, draft legislation. They draft letters that uh, members of Congress sign. It's really part of, it's part of their job uh, to advocate on behalf of, of their constituents uh, in, in front of the uh, in front of the the federal agencies and uh, lawmakers. But it does get it does get to be pretty um, uh, pretty active and um, uh, uh, hard nosed on Capitol Hill because you have groups FSI on one side, the Investment Advisor Association on the other, who are trying to build support uh, for their uh, 
their particular initiatives and are working very closely with, with lawmakers. Um, another breakthrough for those who are trying to stop the Department of Labor fiduciary duty rule is, is a group of Senate Democrats wrote a letter in August urging delay in the labor fiduciary duty rules. Again, the group said they wanted coordination between the SEC and DOL. Re Republicans in the House uh, uh, sponsored the House bill that would stop, would stop the labor fiduciary duty rule. They got um, 30 Democrats to support that bill last week. That's fewer than they were hoping for. Most observers said there would be 50 to 70 Democrats. It turned out to be 30. Part of the reason for the, the decline is that the administration uh, vowed to veto the bill. So if you're a Democratic House member, why do you want to sign on to a bill that the president, who's the head of your party, has already said he's going to veto? So what will be interesting to see is whether these Senate Democrats will uh, try to move their own bill. It's not likely that they will because the chairman of the of the Senate Banking Committee, who's a Democrat, said that the, the committee has no uh, interest in it. The um, mandatory arbitration is another uh, uh, um, point of tension between uh, investor advocates and the industry. There's a House Democrat who's introduced a bill to end ma uh, mandatory arbitration clauses in brokerage contracts with clients. Right now, uh, in the U.S., almost every brokerage contract includes a clause that requires any claim by an investor to go uh, through arbitration at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, which is the broker regulator, um, uh, the, the self-regulatory organization for brokers. Investor advocates say investors should have a choice. They, they should have a choice of either doing mandatory arbitration or um, uh, seeking their day in court. The, um, and as the subhead says, the measure, measure faces an uphill battle because he's a, um, a Democrat in the House in the minority, so it's unlikely that bill will go anywhere, but they're trying. The, the, the tension in, um, in Washington, the political tension, has for the first time, and in an unusual way, reached the level of affecting the choice for the head of our Federal Reserve System, the U.S. Uh, um, bank, uh, central bank. Uh, Janet Yellen has now been uh, nominated as the successor to Ben Bern Bernanke. But before that uh, occur occurred a couple of weeks ago, over the summer, there, there was a, a big debate over whether Yellen or uh, Larry Summers should, should uh, get the, be the nominee and uh, Democrats and, well, mostly Democrats were uh, sort of having an internal fight over this. And uh, it rose to the point where uh, even we were asking investment advisors who, who they liked better, <laughs> uh, Yellen or um, uh, Summers, because it's a, uh, um, it, it was such a uh, flashpoint. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an example of how the politics of regulation is becoming a lot more like the politics of the budget and the politics of uh, the debt limit. Uh, ev everything in Washington is becoming politically uh, brittle. And uh, nowhere is that brittleness more uh, apparent than in the, um, uh, the budget battle. So on the Senate side, you have a Democratic majority who's trying to give the SEC its full funding request. House Republicans uh, want to hold the SEC at its current budget level, and um, uh, and right now the the federal government is operating under what's called a continuing resolution, which keeps the SEC at its current level, uh, along with that sixty-six million dollar um, sequester cut. The um, Mary Jo White uh, became the chairman of the SEC earlier this year. And she received a voice vote, so hers was an uncontroversial nomination. And she has brought to the SEC a particular focus on enforcement. She has, uh, um, she has uh, uh, instituted a, a new approach in which uh, financial companies will have to admit culpability when they settle claims. Up until now, almost every SEC case was resolved in what's called a, a, a no, uh, was resolved in a way in which companies did not have to admit 
uh, guilt. So they neither admitted nor denied the claim, but they settled it. That, that is what uh, occurred in almost every case. She has said, hold on a minute, we're now going to make these companies admit their guilt. And she has brought a, a, um, a more of a focus on enforcement at the SEC. She's the former um, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, essentially the U.S. Attorney for Manhattan, which encompasses the financial district. It's the, uh, it was the, the, um, the job that uh, Rudolph Giuliani had before he became mayor of New York. He made a name for himself prosecuting mob bosses. Mary Jo White also prosecuted mob bosses and terrorists. And, um, and she's brought that same verve to the, uh, to the SEC. And uh, the, um, one, of the, one of the major uh, points of, another major point of tension is whether investment advisors, whether there will be a self-regulatory organization to oversee investment advisors. The investment advisors are resisting this because they don't want it to be the financial industry regulatory authority, the broker um, uh, overseer. And uh, over the last year, this has been a, a point of uh, controversy on Capitol Hill. As I said earlier, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who's right there, uh, introduced uh, leg legislation that would um, allow the SEC to charge user fees. Essentially, it would be a boost to the SEC budget to oversee advisors. But last year in 2012, uh, FINRA tried and failed to push through Congress legislation that would establish a self-regulatory organization for investment advisors. Uh, FINRA is positioning itself to be the advisor SRO. And um, the, the, it recently announced that it would conduct its own cost-benefit analyses of current and future rules. And part of the reason it did that is because it wants to show itself to Republican lawmakers as a regulator that, that is cognizant of cost-benefit analysis and will um, not uh, um, uh, foist rules on, onto the market that are, that are too costly and too burdensome. But that, that's an example of how pressure from uh, Capitol Hill can cause regulators to change their tactics and, and approach approaches. So the wait for financial reform is going to continue. Uh, Republicans are likely to maintain the control of the House of Representatives in 2014. Democrats are likely to hold on to the Senate. And really what this all comes down to is there's going to be more to wait. There's going to be more uh, delay. And in the meantime, what happens to investor protection and to uh, uh, transparency in the market. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll have to see about that. Right now, the, the Wall Street is is having its way. They they always put more money uh, and effort, not an effort. They they always put more money into lobbying than the the consumer and client advocates do. And they usually gain more leverage with the regulators uh, as well. And we're seeing that with the slowdown on fiduciary duty. It, it has not been proposed. The SEC is conducting a cost-benefit analysis now. It will review that analysis before deciding whether to move forward with a rule. And, and the reason things are slowing down is because uh, uh, companies that are parts of the financial industry that think they'll be hurt by it, especially uh, brokers who sell insurance products like annuities which have high fees, they're very costly. So insurance interest groups are fighting hard against fiduciary duty and they're, and they're slowing it down. And um, the, uh, you know, in, in the meantime, one of the uh, provisions that, that most directly uh, addressed uh, consumer protection, uh, the fiduciary duty provision of Dodd-Frank is, uh, is languishing at the, uh, at the SEC. So um, that's sort of an overview of, of, uh, of where we are now and um, I'd, be, uh, I'd be happy to, to take questions. So uh, <clears throat> thank you Mark for your speech. I have uh, one question. Uh, it's on uh, maybe directly on uh, on the title. 
how the media covers the politics of regulations. <laughs> Is there a uh, can you cite any examples where the media's coverage influenced the politics of regulation? It, it um, th right, of, of course, the, uh, the, the media um, influence on it. There was, um, there have been uh, stories about um, uh, FINRA's, the, the broker-dealer uh, regulator, about uh, FINRA's ability, well, let me put it this way. There have been studies recently about how FINRA's arbitration system makes it far too easy for brokers to clear their um, uh, their records of, uh, of um, uh, client claims against them. That study came out a couple of weeks ago, and that study followed a uh, an exhaustive uh, investigation by the Wall Street Journal of of a problem with um, rogue brokers. And uh, those two developments have uh, caused FINRA to uh, refocus on, uh, on arbitration, to, um, uh, to look at reforming it, and uh, to uh, increase training uh, of, uh, of arbitrators. So that's, that's, that's one example where uh, oversight of brokers has been, um, uh, I mean, oversight of arbitration uh, is is going to be improved by by that uh, by that coverage. And there's th there's also sort of the um, the 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 weekly and daily coverage of uh, of developments at um, uh, at regulators at um, agencies where there's a, a difference between. Um, the, the Republicans and Democrats on a commission on a particular issue that then uh, uh, leads to a greater uh, um, focus on that issue and a more in-depth uh, um, uh, um, debate about it. So there are a lot of there are a lot of examples of that. But, but most recently, this um, um, this controversy over uh, over arbitration has uh, has gained new depth through through uh, through media coverage. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in your lecture that 39% uh, of the <clears throat> of the legislation for financial companies had already been implemented. Was there a certain deadline in the legislation, and are there no pen penalties for not implementing the regulations for before the deadline? Right. If, if there is one. Right. Uh, there are uh, where there were deadlines for. Uh, Regulations, they've they've been they've been blown, and but there are no penalties. That that's that's the catch in Dodd Frank. There there were uh, deadlines for various rules, like for instance, uh, the derivatives rule, uh, which will have a worldwide uh, impact. Um, rules surrounded uh, trading and derivatives. Uh, rules uh, the the so-called Volcker rule uh, about um, the extent to which. Uh, banks can be involved in proprietary trading uh, was supposed to be resolved a, a year ago and it may be another year before regulators uh, promulgate that rule. So on derivatives and the Volcker rule we have a situation where um, uh, there have been long delays but there are no penalties for that. There's, there's no repercussions. In fact one of the one of the the um, authors of the bill, Barney Frank, the Frank part of Dodd Frank, uh, said that the um, there there are no penalties and that the um, the deadlines are were essentially uh, aspirational uh, in Dodd Frank. But uh, the the regulatory process can be long and slow, and that's to the benefit of of the industry. They can really they can really drag things out. Uh, what are the strategic benefits of delaying this reform process? Uh, if you know, smart money, for example, is moving into uh, food production these days, I notice. 
which might indicate that they are thinking of crashing the dollar and the euro. And uh, so I'm thinking, is there any benefit from delaying these reforms if such a strategy were pursued? The benefit of delaying reform? Yeah, well, the, those who are those who are trying to, to, to delay it would, would say that the, um, uh, the benefit is that you're not foisting new and costly, uh, burdensome and costly rules on, uh, on the industry and that, they, that it can continue to recover. Uh, the stock market in the U.S. is doing very well. The last time I checked, uh, setting the S&P 500 index is setting new records. So in the industry, you have a lot of talk about how the uh, the stock market has bounced back and things are fine, and uh, and let's not um, delay the, uh, the the or let's not undermine the the, the good thing that's that's going on. So uh, that would be the uh, the argument in favor of uh, of delay, and I suppose the tr strategic uh, benefit of uh, of delay. Um, but on the other hand, as I said, you have these uh, financial companies that are are bemoaning the fact that there's uncertainty, that they don't know what's going to happen next, that they don't know how the regulators, what the regulators are going to, what kind of rules they're going to promulgate. And that's true, but on the other hand, they're, they're delaying the process by insisting on, on, on elaborate cost-benefit analyses, so they're, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They want to, they want to um, preserve the market the way it is, they want to complain about uncertainty, but then they prolong uncertainty. Uh, with their, um, um, uh, you know, with their different uh, different tactics. Oh, there's a yeah, question. Uh, yeah, I have a question regarding this um, these cost benefit analysis. Are they generally reviewed as as a delay tactic, or is this a uh, a uh, more general approach towards the aim of trying to minimize uh, regulation in general. Right. That's, you know, the, the, be the beauty of that uh, is in, truly in the eye of the beholder. Uh, those who are pushing cost-benefit analysis uh, are um, always say that what they want is uh, smart regulation. That, that's a buzzword in Washington, smart regulation. So uh, no, one, no one argues for no regulation, uh, but, but they want smart regulation, they want regulation that works. So proponents of cost-benefit analysis say the way you get to smart regulation is you define what the problem is, you explain how you're going to address that problem, and then you illustrate the regulatory impact on the market, and you do this in a rigorous way. Okay, that, that's what they say when they don't like a rule. If they do like a rule, however, cost-benefit analysis is something that's just sort of um, tossed away. I, I mean, an example of this is the recent rule that the SEC approved for, the, um, the, uh, for advertising private funds and unregulated securities. In that case, the investor advocates, the consumer advocates were saying, wait a minute, there was hardly any cost-benefit analysis done on this rule, which is true. I mean, it, it was it was passed with with perfunctory analysis. Now, in that case, the industry and particularly Republicans on Capitol Hill were were didn't have a problem because they they were arguing that 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 if uh, these private funds could advertise, they could more easily find investors, they could raise capital and they could put their ideas in, into action, they could build companies and increase employment, they could create jobs. So, so they were all for it. But in this case, the consumer advocates were saying to the SEC, hey, you haven't done the first thing to, to figure out whether ordinary investors are going to be harmed by this. So it really depends on who's, whose ox is being gored. They both, um, both sides, um, you know, those who favor cost-benefit analysis will say this is, we do this in order to produce smart regulation. Those who oppose it say no, this is just a delaying tactic. And then depending on the particular rule, they sort of switch sides. And you know, one side wants the cost-benefit analysis and, and the other side doesn't. 
So it, it becomes a, um, a political football, and it's kicked around. I noticed I, last, last night I was going through uh, NFL withdrawal, the National Football League uh, in the U.S., because I couldn't, I didn't have access to, to, to Sky Sports 2, unfortunately. They were showing the New Orleans, New York Jets game. So I watched a lot of soccer last night, and uh, which I don't do in the U.S. But in, in soccer, there's, there's the, the ball goes all over the field, and, and you really have to take pleasure in incremental advances that don't really result in any scoring, or incremental setbacks that don't result in any scoring, because it's rare that the ball actually goes into the goal. And that's kind of the way it is in, in financial regulation in the U.S. With the, um, you know, between cost-benefit analyses and, and comment letters, the fact that the SEC is split three to two, so each side has some leverage to make its point. The SEC generally doesn't like to pass rules three to two. It's so much better to be unanimous at five and zero oh, because if you're at three and two, you give courts, for instance, uh, a reason to overturn your rules. A court opinion will cite the fact that there were two dissenters on this rule, and the court might agree with those dissenters. So the SEC wants to be five and zero. Oh. Well, you know, it's it's three two. There are all these leverage points. The ball goes to one end of the field, and then the other end of the field, and then there's a shot on goal that's just wide, or you know, a shot that's just over the the net, or whatever. And um, and and there's a lot of that in financial regulation and cost benefit analysis is is an example of this. You know, at one point, one side really likes it and is pushing the ball down the field, and then all of a sudden, the other side takes control of the ball, pushes it back the other way, and um, but uh, neither one really really kicks the goal, or really scores much. I, you know, they there aren't there aren't a lot of crisp um, wins and losses in in uh, in financial regulation, and that's what leads leads to the delay. Also, by the way. The reason why, you may have heard of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the U.S., Republicans hate this thing. And the reason is, it was created by Dodd-Frank, and one of the reasons they hate it is it is run by a director. There's one director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the CFPB uh, looks at things like um, um, uh, consumer loans, credit card charges, things like that. Well, there, there's no commission. The, the, the Republicans don't have any way to make a point to, to get, they have no leverage at the CFPB for their point of view, because it's just one director who's appointed by a Democratic, in a Democratic administration, appointed by a Democratic president. That's why they, that's one of the reasons they hate that. That's one of the reasons they like commissions. It's because commission adds, commissions add uh, more leverage points and, um, and make it uh, more democratic, a democratic small d process for, uh, for regulation. May there, I? There's one other thing. I, uh, Bill Hamar and I were talking yesterday, and he asked me to mention uh, this Sarbanes-Oxley, which I didn't have a chance to do in my uh, prepared remarks. But Sarbanes-Oxley was a very different uh, animal from Dodd-Frank. For one thing, Dodd Frank uh, ran some 800 pages. The legislation was 800 pages long. Sox, the Sarbanes Oxley uh, bill, was about 16 pages, I believe. Sarbanes Oxley was implemented in a much more straightforward and efficient way than um, uh, Dodd Frank. A and um, and it's, I mean, it's had uh, an impact on the market. Uh, firms now have to be um, audited by an independent accounting firm that's approved by the, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And uh, how SOX is still having an impact, to, or one of the ways SOX is still having an impact today, is that the PCAOB uh, is requiring broker-dealer audits as well. Uh, the PCAOB recently passed a, a rule uh, that um, requires brokers to, to get um, audited by public accounting firms and for those audits uh, then to be um, uh, submitted to the PCAOB. So, so broker-dealers 
Um, you know, public companies went through this when SOX was passed back in 2003, I think it was, 2002, 2003, and, and now broker-dealers are going through the same situation. So you have, um, um, you have a situation where that, uh, that, that, that approach is being, being expanded. Uh, I would like to add one uh, comment on, on your lecture. Or, or question. Uh, I believe that rules and regulations on the financial market are to protect the clients, the institutional investors as well as general public and individuals. But uh, uh, my instinct after your lecture is that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, is protecting the financial uh, industry, not the clients. In my mind, uh, the, we should protect the client, financial stability, and through that, uh, the financial institutions. That's, that's certainly the argument that, that um, fiduciary advocates and consumer advocates are, are making is that uh, there's far too much attention paid to keeping the costs and regulatory burdens low for financial institutions and, and too little attention being paid to consumer protection. And, and that's really what this, this whole debate about fiduciary duty boils down to. I mean, the, the, um, what Dodd-Frank gave the SEC the authority to do was, was pass a rule, uh, promulgate a rule that would require brokers to act in the best interest of their clients. That authority was given to the SEC three and a half years ago, but it was an optional rule. It was not mandatory. So we're in a situation where the SEC is way behind on the mandatory rules. When I said that 39.3 percent had been, had been finalized, that's 39.3% of the mandatory rules, the ones they have to do. So the optional ones get pushed farther and farther down the agenda. And for three and a half years, there's been basically nothing done uh, on, on one of the provisions that most directly protects a consumer, that most directly protects someone like, like you, and I'll speak for myself, like me, who <laughs> I, I don't know what, your, what amount of investable assets each of you has, but for someone like me, uh, you know, an ordinary investor, um, that, that rule is, is just dead in the water. And the, the Department of Labor is poised right now, ready to propose a rule that would require brokers who advise IRAs and 401k plans to act in the best interests of their clients. And the House just passed a bill last week, 254 to 166, that told the Department of Labor to stop. Don't do that. Hold on. Wait for the SEC. But the SEC, you know, might decide to take a pass. So, so we're at a, in a situation where you're right. The, the things that are directly going to affect uh, an ordinary consumer, someone who needs protection, are um, are are being um, delayed, pushed down the agenda, and um, and and um, given all sorts of obstacles to overcome. And this is frustrating uh, consumer advocates and those who who think that um, consumers need more help, especially because consumers are no more in knowledgeable about the markets today than they were in 2007, 2008. They, they still don't know the, 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 the relationship between bond interest rates and bond prices, for instance. None of that has changed. But the one thing in Don Frank that could really impact them uh, is, is dormant for the moment. So uh, you're right, I mean, the, there's, not a lot happening for consumer protection at the moment. If I add on something, on a comment. Uh, as I understand, the last lecture here is that Europe is heading in a quite different direction. And as I, um, when I am reading through directives from the European Union, it's more or less more about the uh, uh, protection of the clients, not uh, protection of the, of the institutes. That's what the EU is doing. Yeah. 
Well, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, how whether there's a meeting of the minds somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, maybe in Iceland, uh, between uh, what's happening in the U.S. and, and, and what's happening in Europe. Uh, if the EU directives are more toward uh, uh, consumer, orient consumer protection orientation, uh, that's going to set the EU on a different path from the U.S. In the U.S., there's, there's, a, there's just the Wall Street, the financial uh, financial companies, brokerages, are uh, are powerful. They're well funded. They've got strong relationships on Capitol Hill. Those strong Capitol Hill relationships affect uh, the, the the regulatory agencies. You know, the SEC listens to Congress. The SEC is ostensibly an independent agency, but if if the chairman of the SEC is being dragged before House committees, and if the House passes a bill. Uh, that that says hey uh, you know says to the Department of Labor don't don't pa don't uh, promulgate this regulation you know the the agencies are going to listen to that it's going to be on their minds it's it's not a it's not a direct um, uh, block t t to them but it is something that's in the back of of their minds and and um, in the U S I mean I don't know maybe the the financial industry doesn't um, lobby uh, Brussels as well as it lobbies Washington, but, uh, and, and maybe it has less leverage over here, over there, but um, uh, in, in the U.S. They're, they're winning. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. They just, they just do it better. The politics, they play, practice the politics of regulation better than the consumer advocates. That's just a fact of life. And one, one last thing, though, because I'm a reporter and I always try to tell both sides of the story, the financial institutions will say, look, brokers already operate under the suitability standard. They have to know their customers. They have to build a relationship with customers. The last thing they want to do is harm their customers or else they're going to lose customers. So what they're saying is that they're already operating under uh, strong regulations. I mean, they, they do make that argument. Again, they're not arguing for no regulation, but they're saying the regulations we already have are enough. Everyone wants smart regulation. Uh, very few people say, you know, no, no regulation. So I think uh, this was the last question and comment. Uh, you uh, mentioned that you thought this was like European football, that things happened slow and there were few goals. I think maybe to Icelanders it looks more like American football. Uh, people are on the field. We don't understand the rules. They don't even use their feet in football. And when something happens, then there's a short break from your sponsor. So that seems to be the situation also. Touche. That's so, right. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it was most interesting. Well, thank you all. Thank you.